welcome you all for this today's CPD lecture on managing varicose uh, ulcers and varicose veins organized by the CPD committee of the College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. Our sponsors for today is Servia International. Please take a moment to fill out the Google form in the chat box. As a housekeeping rule, before we start, please keep your microphones on mute. And if you have any questions, please type it on the chat box in the chat box. So to introduce the speaker today, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our resource person, uh, Professor DJ Anthony. He's a consultant surgeon. He's the professor and the head of department of the anatomy uh, department at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. His postgraduate qualifications are MS, FRCS, FC, SSL. He's a graduate from the University of Peradeniya and he gained his postgraduate qualifications from PIM Colombo, following which he completed his overseas training in breast and colorectal surgery at Princess Royal Hospital in Farnborough, Kent, UK. He has many accolades. He was the former president of the Antimical Society of Sri Lanka. He's the chairman of the basic medical sciences at the PGIM. He's a member of the board of study in radiology. He's also a postgraduate examiner in general surgery, ophthalmology, obstetrics and gynecology, sports medicine, and so on. He was an examiner of the Royal College of Surgeons in England for 15 years, and he was the immediate past president of the Arts Council of the University of Colombo. He has many publications in peer-reviewed index journal, and he's also been doing general practice for the past 30 years. So without further ado, let me uh, open the floor to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dinechani, for those uh, kind words of introduction. I appreciate it. And uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Darrell Matthews, the president of the College of General Practitioners in Sri Lanka. Uh, Dr. Shobhavi, uh, chairman of the CPD committee. I wish to extend my sincere thanks to you uh, for inviting me to deliver this lecture. And uh, thank you very much for those who have joined. And uh, please, uh, if you do have any questions, you can put up in the chat or we can have a question and answer session in the end. So I, I, I'm going to share my screen now. All right, hope you can share my screen very well now. Uh, <clears throat> today, we are going to talk about uh, varicose veins and the management of uh, varicose ulcers in brief. And this is a very common entity in day-to-day -day life and we all see varicose veins in our practice. And um, to give an introduction, Varicose veins, as you can see, are just dilated and tortuous veins. You can see the dilated veins and they are tortuous. And why are they dilated and tortuous? Because they can't bear the column of uh, blood. Normally, uh, the blood, venous blood, flows back to the heart via veins, you know that. And uh, if the veins are engorged with blood, they can't bear that column, that column becomes very he heavy and the vein become tortuous. So let us just briefly uh, discuss how the veins, uh, the blood from the lower limbs are brought back to the heart. Very brief introduction. So this is the arterial circulation. We are not going to discuss about that today. The veins, of course, when you consider, um, I'll take my pen, right. In fact, the venous drainage uh, is via, you know, in between the muscles, right? There are deep veins in between the muscles. And every time you do some activity, muscular activity, you run or walk or do something, the muscle pump, the muscles press these veins and there are valves in the veins like that. So it, it prevents backflow 
those are so unidirectional valves. Therefore, the blood flows uh, in an upward direction back to the heart. Well, there are other factors which influence like thoracic pump and various things. Uh, but the, one of the main factors responsible for this upward uh, flow of blood is the contraction of muscles. All right? So that's the deep system. In addition, there is a superficial system. Right? There are superficial veins like that. And this superficial system, from the superficial system, there are veins which connects uh, with the deep veins like that. And the, normally the blood flow is from superficial to deep. So this blood will come this way. And also the superficial system will, they also have valves like that. So they, their blood flow is also this way, okay? They also flow upwards like that. And eventually, ultimately, somewhere in the groin, this superficial system will open to the deep system. Like that. Okay. And that is one. There is another superficial system. There is a small vein in the calf, which will also open uh, to this deep system. Like that. Okay. So, you have two systems, uh, deep system and the superficial system. Superficial system, you have two major veins. This we will call the long saphenous vein. The other one we will call this short saphenous vein because it is short. It doesn't go up to groin. It, it, it ends somewhere around knee level, right? So you have long saphenous, short saphenous, and the connecting veins, perforators, and then you have deep veins. All right, so let us see. Yes, this is how it runs upwards. You can see very clearly the deep veins carry blood upwards like that. And the superficial veins also carry upwards, uh, the blood upwards like that. And there are connecting veins, uh, which, which they have to per pierce the deep pressure. This is deep pressure, right? So they have to pierce the deep pressure and connect with the deep veins. And yeah, this is another diagram for you to easily understand. Now this is the leg, you can see the outline of the leg. And this is the deep vein, these are the deep veins, right? There are names, anterior tibial, posterior tibial and various things and then popliteal veins and things so on. Ultimately they open into the femoral vein. So then you have the long saphenous vein like that, which goes and eventually, ultimately, they, it opens into the femoral vein. So this junction, you call it saphenofemoral junction, saphenofemoral junction. And uh, there is a big valve there also, controlling backflow, right? And this is small saphenous vein in the calf, right? And it comes like that, it comes up and it opens into the popliteal vein and there's a well there also, that is saphenopopliteal vein, SP, right? So, okay. So <clears throat> varicose veins do occur because there are incompetencies of these valves. The valves become incompetent. Now this valve is very competent, normal vein, but here, this side is an abnormal valve. The valve is incompetent, so blood flow the other way, backwards. So the vein becomes very heavy and vein become torn just like that. So in a normal uh, circumstance, it won't happen. Okay, so this is another uh, diagram to, for you to easily understand, right? The superficial system, the deep system, and how the valves are directed. Okay, so you can see healthy vein, and then when the vein is heavy, it becomes very, its walls become thin because it is dilated. 
So, and if one of these veins become very, very superficial with a thin wall, even slight scratch can result in damage to the vein and, and it can cause severe bleed. Right, so what problems do we get because of these varicose veins? Mm. Now, if you analyze the varicose vein, um, the venous wall, right? So this is the vein wall. Normal vein wall will have an endothelium. So these are flat cells, there are endothelial cells, all right? So when the valve, when the vein becomes dilated, okay, then you can understand the blood flow changes, right? There, is, there are certain things uh, uh, which cause changes to the blood flow. And uh, that will result in uh, some leukocytes, white blood cells, right? That will open up these uh, junctions between the cells, junctions between the cells. It's not simply because of the dilatation. There are, uh, there are um, vasoactive uh, chemicals okay uh, which comes and uh, act on these endothelial cells and then it become then thereby it causes increased vascular permeability increased vascular permeability the junctions open up and then the white blood cells will come out okay it will come out and with that passively the red blood cells also will follow, right? And all, you know, all these veins contain waste products. They will also come out, the superoxide radicals and whatnot, right? So these vein, these waste products are irritant to the skin and uh, irritant to the tissues. So you can have, in fact, a vague pain around that area right and not only that you can have irritation so a little bit of scratching can result and not only that uh, there will be excess extracellular fluid right if your lymphatics are also not working properly and that excess load will not be taken back to this bloodstream therefore there will be edema in that region and the red blood cells will come out and they will be degraded and then the hemoglobin will come out and that will result in deposition of iron pigments, hemosiderine you know, or something like that. So the color also will change. The color might become black. Okay. So you can see, so all this will lead to a bit of inflammation and a little bit of yeah. fibrosis as well. Okay, so, uh, so through that mechanism, if you do have varicose veins, you can have uh, problems like, um, like you can have edema, right? you can have irritation and you can have a scratch and then you can have an ulcer, right? Because of this uh, inflammation going on. Right? You can have an ulcer. And uh, in fact, ulcer is the most, one of the commonest, right? Edema also can happen and uh, with a pain. And suddenly, if the vein becomes very thin and if it is very close to the skin, this dilated vein, and it is very close to the skin surface, this can rupture and cause severe bleeding. So those are some of the complications of varicose veins. So we need to treat these varicose veins because of these complications. Not all varicose veins will give rise to complications. So we will think about the. So if these things, varicose veins give rise to complications, then of course we need to 
treat this. So what are the treatment principles of varicose veins? So the cause of varicose vein, why it is happening? It's because if you go back to our first slides, it's because of incompetent valves, incompetent valves, right? So you have the femoral vein, the big femoral vein, and then long saphenous vein joining that. And there's a big valve here, saphenofemoral valve. So this is the saphenous, long saphenous, okay? And there's a big, there's a small one here, small saphenous, okay? So there's a valve here as well. So the tre treatment principles, in fact, first we have to identify where the problems are. So the varicose veins could be due to an incompetence of the saphino uh, femoral valve here, SF5. It can result in big gush of blood coming back. So the, all the valves will become incompetent. And then you can have long saphenous vein, varicose veins. It could be due to saphenopopliteal incompetence. If this becomes incompetent, again you can you will have tortuous vein along the distribution of saphenopopliteal, the, pop, the small saphenous vein. Not only that, if there are, you know, the perforator in if, if the perforators are incompetent, normally the blood flow is from superficial to deep. If the perforator becomes incompetent, then of course again you will because there will be gush of blood from deep to superficial. And again, this will be dilated. So this is okay, right? In, but still, if this is okay, but perforator becomes incompetent, again you will have varicose veins. So basically, it could be either due to saphenophob femoral incompetence, saphenopopliteal incompetence, or perforator incompetence. Okay. Right. So it's so you have to address these incompetent valves when you are treating varicose vein. Right. So basically, if you ligate here. SF ligation, then you control that, right? If you ligate here, it's not that common as SF5, uh, SPI. If you ligate here, then that vein is controlled, right? Perforator veins, of course, difficult to ligate. There was a technique earlier called subfacial ligation. Now, I don't think now with laser, they don't do those kind of things. Anyway, so those are the treatment principles. Only thing is, if you ligate only here, if you ligate the long saphenous vein here, the, there will be, okay, you control this, but very soon he is going to get the, get varicose veins again. Why is that? Because there are a lot of other veins joining with the other veins in this area. And not only that, there are other veins feeding the, uh, connecting the uh, femoral vein and the long saphenous vein, the perforators and things. Therefore, if you leave these side branches, right, like superficial epigastric, superficial external, we would end up various things. There are about medial femoral, lateral femoral, various things. So all these branches have to be ligated with saphenofemoral ligation. Not only that, you have to strip the entire vein like that up to the knee, up to the knee. Otherwise, there will be again varicose veins because there is a big perforator here connecting, the, it's called mid thigh perforator, connecting the deep vein and the superficial vein. Therefore, you sort out here, but again, there will be gush of blood coming from this perforator back into the this will be filled. So you have to, so the correct uh, operation would be SF ligation with ligating all the side branches. Then you have to strip the entire vein up to the knee. You normally don't strip below the knee simply because there is a nerve here called saphenous nerve 
which comes along with the long sapinous vein, if you strip below the knee, you are going to, you will probably strip the saphenous nerve as well, and there will be a lot of numbness in this area. Patient will come back to you, be troubling you all the time with benumb sensation in this area. Therefore, you normally don't strip below the knee. Okay. And uh, so below knees, of course, how do you then treat? Uh, below knee, of course, you do multiple step revulsions, you call them, from place to place. You know, from here you make an incision and take out that segment. Here you make an incision, take out that segment. So when then this all the perforators will be clotted. Hmm? They will clot, the, the, the blood will clot inside that and that's the, and fibrosis and that's the end of the valve. So that is how you sort out, sort out things. And now of course you have laser treatment. So you can, uh, using laser, you can burn all these up to groin and uh, then, so that is surgery. Then there is, you all are familiar with the other technique, injection. What you do is you inject sodium tetradicyl sulfate here. And what you do is you create an inflammation inside the endothelial, the, of the endothelial lining of the vein. And then you apply a crepe bandage and keep it tight for about 14 days. And uh, then the, it will result in clotting of uh, these perforators, where the perforators are and all these. So, and the endothelial lining will be stick together. But if you do injection in the presence of saphenofemoral incompetence, this is not going to work because you can inject here. But the, again, the blood flow will come from this because these valves are not competent. So blood will again flow back. And then after some years, these things will open up. So before that, you need to make sure before injecting that these valves are okay, right? Okay, so as I explained you, you deal with uh, these veins depending on the site above knee or below knee. And so what if you get an ulcer? So this is a varicose ulcer. It's a classic ulcer, varicose ulcer. Normally you get it in gait area. This is the area you get it. And you can see that it's a superficial ulcer. Right? Not much slough there. It's red in color. And uh, you have to, before treating, diagnose it correctly. Uh, and so you have to have some idea about the other type of ulcers, not to mistake with arterial ulcers or diabetic ulcers or anything else. Let us see how do you do that. Now, this one, do you think it is a varicose ulcer? Uh, no, it is not. You can see a lot of slough there. And uh, the area uh, suggests that it is probably a trophic ulcer. This is a diabetic ulcer. So this is not a varicose ulcer, so surely you don't get there. And this is another example of a diabetic ulcer, trophic ulcer, because uh, you can see callus formation here, right? A lot of callus there, although this is clean, not much slough. So this is the classic place where you get uh, diabetic ulcers because of the abnormal pressures. Uh, do you think this is a varicose ulcer? It looks a bit angry, isn't it? Mm, lot of sort of inflammation going on around. Although not much slough, and it is extremely painful. These ulcers very difficult to manage. Very difficult to manage these ulcers. Uh, it's a challenge to the clinician, really. Right? So these are, this is vasculitis. Mm -hmm. This is vasculitis. Uh, the extreme case is pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, there's so much of inflammation and a uh, lot of pain 
And whatever you do, it's very difficult to treat these things. Sometimes you have to use high dose of steroids. Now this one, it's not a varicose arch. So you can see surrounding lymphedema. Again, it's a very difficult ulcer to treat. These patients come back and they go on dressing for ages, for years and years, and it's very difficult to treat these things. It's not a varicose ulcer. Try not to strap these things, no point. Um, all right, so let us uh, imagine that you get a varicose ulcer like that. Um, before the treatment, it is before surgery, it's always better to get the ulcer to heal. So how do you get the ulcer to heal? Uh, you do what in the, 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 the cause of the ulcer is because of the varicose vein. Why you get the ulcer? Because of the high pressure inside the veins. That is the root cause, isn't it? High pressure. So if you take off the pressure, then the ulcer should heal. So how do you take off the pressure? For that, you apply this compression bandage, right? Compression bandage and leave it for some time. And then no pressure and ulcer, will, ulcer should heal. That procedure is called strapping. Let us see how you do that. The first layer you have to, now you can clean this ulcer with normal saline. Normally, I don't use uh, providonidine or surgical spritz or anything else. I use only saline to clean these ulcers. Mm. Of course, for the surrounding skin, you may use uh, providonidine and spirits, but not for tissues. Um, I use the least uh, toxic solution, that is normal saline. And uh, mind you, if you use uh, providonidine and spirits for a wound like that, you are asking for trouble, right? It's very, very toxic and irritant, right? So here, so you, after cleaning with uh, normal saline, you can apply a non-adhesive dressing, non-adhesive dressing, right? either wax goes, you know, this Vaseline goes. So hmm, there are a lot of preparations commercially available. You can like that, you can put that because when you remove it after one week, you shouldn't disturb the granulation tissue. That's the idea. And then after that, as the first layer, you have to use a layer of cotton wool. The idea why you use cotton wool uh, is there are a lot of, you know, contours here. Hmm? There are a lot of contours. If you use only the bandage, crepe bandage, then there will be, um, you know, different, different pressures at different points. The pressure is not equally dissipated along the leg. So to give an equally dissipated or equal pressure gradient, right, it's a gradual pressure gradient, then you have to apply this cotton wool. Now, I rather prefer, now this is the commercially available one, it's very nice and nice looking and easy to apply also, looks very beautiful. But the thing is, it is a bit synthetic, I, I guess, because uh, with sweating and things, it becomes irritant and sometimes it causes irritation of the wound. In my experience, the plain cotton rolls we have, if you make uh, uh, out of cotton wool, cotton roll, that's much more better, although it doesn't look <laughs> uh, beautiful. Anyway, this is not bad. For convenience, this can be used. And so you apply that from, you start, uh, sorry, you start at the base of the metatarsals somewhere here. 
and then you go base of the toes right and then you go up to sorry i can't show you here you go up to knee okay up to knee you don't stop only here because the pressure is coming from top so that's the next layer okay usually that is enough i know some people use elastoplast it is a bit more expensive it's not necessary most of the time with correct application of this you can counteract the venous pressure right so after that you keep it for about uh, one week or two weeks even two weeks you can keep depending on the amount of uh, exceed it uh, you expect if it is a small one you can keep it even for two weeks and it eventually this is the same leg it heals very nicely you can see that not a sign of ulcer isn't it right and after that you can deal with the varicose veins right and uh, what about the medical management can you uh, manage these varicose veins with tablets and things now don't forget these patients they do have um, lot of pain lot of pain irritation so most of the time you will have to give some analgesics anti irritants anti histamines uh what about antibiotics do you normally give antibiotics to these varicose ulcers well uh it is not necessary because normally varicose ulcers are very clean and they are not infected uh but having said that you know there is tissue edema right there is tissue edema so if this is the leg sole and leg right what for whatever the reason if the leg is sole and right that is a good culture medium for bacteria right or lymphedema or whatever the edema it's a good culture medium for bacteria therefore secondary infection is very likely it can happen Uh, this happens even after cellulitis right it takes ages now you get rid of cellulitis but your lymphatics are blocked and for the lymphatics to work it takes ages so the swelling might persist for some time so that period during that period patient is very vulnerable to get another infection so same here so to prevent that type of infection i normally use a prophylactic dose of penicillin say 500 mg a uh, bd something like that okay uh, or if the patient is allergic erythromycin 250 mg bd uh, that should be all right until the wound heals sometimes i uh, continue with that unless i am pretty sure that there there is no swelling uh, edema hmm. right and uh, some people i know use this one micronized purified flavonoid fraction right uh, commercially available preparations are there it comes in 500 mg i think and uh, these drugs the i went through the literature as well uh, apparently these drugs cause uh, um, endothelial permeability it decreases the permeability and it causes it uh, and it has an anti inflammatory effect in that region therefore exacerbation and swelling can be controlled to a certain extent by using these drugs uh, so this is uh, may this may be valuable especially in um, you know uh, inflamed ulcers in varicose veins uh, when you start when they have a lot of pain and uh, irritation uh, when you use these drugs their symptoms will definitely Uh, improve uh, i wouldn't recommend to use this drug alone you have to combine with the other techniques definitely mm, and the same for hemorrhoids uh, inflamed hemorrhoids sometimes until the definitive treatment or surgical treatment is achieved uh, to reduce congestion you can use 
these drugs. Okay. And what about asymptomatic varicose veins? You may have seen enough asymptomatic, even you and I might be having some few varicose veins. Well, the treatment is normally you don't intervene. You don't intervene if they are asymptomatic. If the varicose veins do not cause any problems to us, we also shouldn't bother them. Just leave it like that. But if you, if the patient has had an ulcer, edema, bleeding, or anything else, you should intervene. But having said that, if it is cosmetically, if the patient is worried, yes, definitely, you have to intervene. Okay. Then you have to go for surgery. Normally, I tell my patients, you can't read these things and you don't read these things. That's what I used to say those days. But now, thanks to laser treatment, I can't say that because very, the vascular surgeons, they treat these spiders, telangiectasis. And uh, these uh, are very, very small varicose veins. Either they can inject using a very, very fine needle. I think it's 40 gauge, 40 or something like that. It's a very fine needle. Or else they can do lace ablation for spiders. So that type of veins uh, you can still treat now. Uh, if the patient is not bothered, of course, uh, no, no need. <laughs> but uh, for cinema actresses, uh, <laughs> you might have to uh, treat these things. Uh, OK, I think that's a very short. It's, it's not a big topic, and I didn't move on to go into these finer details of pathophysiology is boring and it's not necessary. That's why I made it very brief. And uh, if you do have any questions, uh, let us discuss. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a very insightful uh, lecture and if there are questions we uh, this is the time to ask them so until uh, there are questions i invite our sponsors to uh, do a small presentation as well mr udaya over to you So there is a question, what is the place yes. of MS? MS? In symptomatic, asymptomatic varicose veins. Yes, I don't think uh, there is a place uh, of uh, this micronized, uh, the, the, the drug I mentioned, the MPFF, in asymptomatic varicose veins. I don't think it's going to be of any help because uh, asymptomatic varicose vein, anyway, the varicose vein is due to valvular incompetence. And that is the basic uh, problem there. And uh, you are not going to correct uh, that tissue, you know. You can't correct the valvular incompetence or you can't like it unless you like get the saponofemoral junction and uh, remove all these veins uh, surgically, or you ablate those veins, you can't correct it. So the root cause is there. The thing is, the complication is due, due to vascular, increased vascular permeability and endothelial damage. 
and migration of leukocytes and red blood cells and vasoactive uh, these substances, superoxide radicals. That is why you get the irritation and inflammation. Those things will be reduced with those drugs. So it's an adjunct. I think it's, you can combine with surgery. Before surgery, you can the surgery might, might and when you're treating ulcers, I think there is a place. Not for asymptomatic varicose veins. So there's another question. What about varicose uh, stockings? Yes. <laughs> I remember uh, people used to, I mean, even in the UK, people used to recommend these varicose stockings for varicose veins. Well, as long as you wear the stocking, you are okay. The pressure is counter, there is counteraction of pressure. The moment you take out the bandage or the stocking, it comes back. So uh, you can, you may prescribe that to a patient who has uh, sort of discomfort in the calf um, and where the varicose veins are because of the, you know, when they, I mean, towards the evening, the long standing patients, you know, patients who stand for a long time, uh, sometimes they get a dragging pain when they stand because less muscle action and uh, the, there will be stagnation of blood there. So to increase the, to assist the muscle pump, uh, you may use these stockings uh, as a temporary basis, right? Until uh, the surgically, until the patient uh, gets the veins corrected surgically. So it's a temporary thing. It's not a permanent thing. <laughs> So there's another question. Usually, what age does varicose veins start appearing? What is the common gender? Is it more in females? Mm. <laughs> uh, age, of course, even in children, you can see those things. But um, generally, it appears after teenage, I think, and adults, no early. Um, late adolescents, young adults, it starts appearing. And children, I haven't done, I haven't seen much uh, patients, but it's not impossible. I mean, there are cases. Uh, normally, uh, adults, no? And then, um, normally adults, young adults, they are the people. Uh, male to female ratio, I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't give that figure straight away. Mm. With my experience, uh, I think I see more, almost equal cases, slightly male, more uh, cases may be in males. I'm not very sure about that, to be honest with you. Mm, more in females, difficult for me to say, because I see both cases, uh, both sexes almost equally, maybe 40 to 60%, something like that. But what is 40, what is 60, I don't know. You'll have to use, uh, you'll have to Google it and see exactly what are the figures like uh, and there is another one i can see yeah. what is the effectiveness of laser treatment in a patient with complications such as ulcer edema and discoloration yes it is like this when there is an ulcer edema and discoloration now we can get the ulcer to heal by doing this trapping normally uh, there are two schools of thoughts. Some people get the ulcer to heal and then correct the varicose veins. They do the operation. Some people I know operate with the ulcer. Their argument is by doing the operation, you completely take off that hydrostatic pressure. And then after that, the ulcer should heal. Right. Um, I really don't know the effects outcome of these two methods. Anyway, they claim that it's better, I don't know. Normally, I still practice the older method. I get the ulcer to heal and I treat the varicose veins uh, with uh, uh, this uh, laser treatment. Yes, it has replaced the surgery now. <laughs> uh, the varicose, uh, the, the, the vascular surgeons, they do a lot of laser treatment for this and it's very effective. It's very effective and it's cheaper as well. So I, most of the time I send uh, my patients 
to because I don't do laser. I send to varicose uh, the vascular surgeons for laser treatment because it's cheaper. And the surgery is a little bit more expensive in the private sector. Uh, and uh, edema will go off. Discoloration to a certain extent, but because hemocytrine deposition, sometimes you can't reverse it. Uh, it might be there. But most of the, they, they feel definitely better. The irritation is gone. It's a very satisfying operation. After that, if you correctly do it for the correct indication, it's a very satisfying operation and uh, you cure the patient almost like for the lifetime. That's it. Uh, what is the place of glyvenol in treatment? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. I have used this tablet ages ago, maybe about 30 years ago, I think it was there. I don't know still whether it is available. Mm. Yeah, I remember that maybe it reduces a bit of uh, uh, edema. You know, all these tablets, they, they uh, correct that uh, inflammation at the endothelial lining and they try to stop inflammation there and cause uh, 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 put a full stop to the migration of leukocytes and uh, uh, mm, red blood cells and various things. So they correct the vascular permeability there. Uh, I think that is how the glyvenol is going to uh, act. I think that's my, I, I'm not very sure about it. And probably it increases the venous, uh, venous tone also. Uh, so I know people have used Tyvenol. I have never, I have used this uh, when I started maybe general practice about 30 years ago. Uh, after that, of course, I never used that one. Uh, okay. I think that is the end of all the questions. Uh, since there are no further questions, we can end the session. Uh, and thank you very much for taking thank the you. time to explain this uh, topic in thank detail. You. And it's very helpful for general practitioners. And I, I am sure everybody learned something from your lecture, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much